Welcome to Newsline Focus. I'm Catherine Kobayashi. People around the world have watched the crisis unfold at Fukushima Daiichi. They've seen workers tackle problem after problem in the struggle to control the nuclear plant. But it's hard to get a solid understanding of what's actually going on inside the facility. Newsline has covered this story every step of the way. And for our first edition of Newsline Focus, we'll give you a detailed picture of the worst nuclear accident since Chernobyl. Fukushima Daiichi is located 230 kilometers northeast of Tokyo. Its first reactor started operating 43 years ago. TEPCO eventually added five others. Together they were capable of producing 4.7 gigawatts of electricity. That's enough to power 14 million homes. The plant was one of the main sources of energy for the Tokyo metropolitan area. The Fukushima Daiichi plant is laid out like this. It's a 3.5 square kilometer site that faces the Pacific Ocean. There are six reactors. Numbers 5 and 6 were offline and did not suffer meltdowns. Let's take a closer look now at the four troubled reactors. Each unit has its own turbine, located in the long rectangular buildings that are closer to the sea. Reactor 1 was the first to melt down after the accident. Then a hydrogen explosion damaged the building. Workers have put a giant cover over it to stop the spread of radioactive substances. The nuclear fuel in Reactor 2 also melted down, but there was no explosion. The building remains largely intact. A meltdown and subsequent hydrogen explosion mangled the Reactor 3 building. The structure still shows signs of damage, even though workers have cleared away most of the debris from the top of it. The Reactor 4 building looks quite different from the others. The unit wasn't loaded with nuclear fuel at the time, so no meltdown. But an explosion still ripped through the structure, likely because hydrogen flowed in from the Reactor 3 building. Crews raced to reinforce it to safeguard its spent fuel assemblies. It stored the largest number of assemblies among the four reactors. A little ways inland from the reactor buildings, you can see rows of storage tanks for contaminated water. There are more than 1,000 of them. TEPCO officials are facing the logistical challenge of securing enough space to add more tanks. They want to double the number within two years. The fuel inside the reactors, of course, is the source of the contamination. The exact situation inside the units is unclear. High levels of radiation have prevented workers from carrying out a full survey. Newsline Focus has been looking into the state of the melted fuel, and based on discussions with TEPCO engineers and our research, we've created a detailed picture of the inside of Reactor 1 and what happened there. The building is about 60 meters tall and the reactor core is at its center. The core is a 20 meter long steel cylinder. It's surrounded by a containment vessel, which is essentially steel wrapped in thick concrete. That's meant to protect the core and isolate the nuclear fuel. Here's how the meltdown happened in reactor one. The March 11, 2011 earthquake and tsunami disabled all power systems used to cool hundreds of fuel rod assemblies. The fuel became so hot, it boiled off the water inside the core. Engineers couldn't stop the reaction. The rods heated up to more than 2,000 degrees Celsius. Then they started to melt. The molten fuel burned through the bottom of the core and then spilled into the containment vessel. TEPCO engineers can't see inside the reactor, so they're monitoring the temperature to visualize what's going on. 48 of 64 thermometers in the unit are functioning. They calculate the difference in temperature between the upper and lower parts of the reactor. Based on the result, they estimate the fuel burrowed 65 centimeters into the layer of concrete at the bottom of the containment vessel. That would mean the fuel is just 30 centimeters from the steel wall of the vessel. Engineers say throughout the meltdown, the fuel mixed with metal and debris and is now an extremely hard mass, weighing more than 70 tons. 
they are continuously injecting water into the unit to keep it as cool as possible. For now, that's all they can do until the technology exists to extract the fuel. Radiation levels are extremely high around reactors 1, 2 and 3 because of the meltdowns. Levels are relatively low in building 4, so crews started decommissioning work here. But it's by no means easy or risk-free. Yoichiro Tatewa gives us an inside look. Workers clad in protective gear have become one of the symbolic images of the operation at Fukushima Daiichi. This command and control center is where they come to get dressed. We got to be careful with not letting the radioactive particles inside of the building. The purpose of this protective suit is to prevent radioactive particles from sticking to the skin. It looks like it protects. Again, you have to. Workers have to wear two layers of socks and three layers of gloves. It is hard to move the fingers. The idea is, if you touch a contaminated object, you can immediately switch to another pair of gloves while keeping the inner layer firmly in place. The mask must be strapped on very tightly to keep out contaminated air. It's, it's kind of hard to breathe, so you have to get used to it. Along the road to the reactor 4 building, structures showing signs of damage from the time of the accident sat untouched. Inside, specially trained teams were working to remove spent fuel rod assemblies from a pool. The rods emit extremely high levels of radiation. They must remain submerged in water. Moving them from the pool to a container requires precision. The protective gear makes the job harder. Even communication is not easy. The workers discuss every detail of the operation in advance. Just watching from the sidelines, I felt hot thirsty and tired. Outside, crews use heavy machinery to do everything from digging wells to building walls. Again, not so easy with the full gear. Workers are screened every time they finish their shift, so they don't carry radioactive particles off-site. They're checked from the tips of their fingers to the soles of their feet. Every month, they're tested for internal radiation exposure. Workers also attend training sessions to keep them aware of the risk posed by radiation. Newcomers learn how to properly wear a mask and other protective gear. Minimizing worker exposure has been and will remain a major challenge. And Yoichiro Tatewa joins us now. Yoichiro, you've been reporting on the crisis at Fukushima Daiichi for some time. What was it like to actually be at the plant? It was somewhat surreal. I could see damaged buildings and structures that were left untouched since the crisis began. It was impressive to see people at work in such a hostile environment. Anyone who goes to the facility faces the invisible threat of radiation. Well, sometimes I really felt like taking my mask off because it was so uncomfortable. But obviously, I couldn't do that. We drove by reactors 1, 2, and 3. But TEPCO officials told us not to get off the bus because radiation levels are too high. The thing is, you can't tell 
where they are high and where they are low. There are hot spots in different places. And with the risk of contaminated water leaks, new spots can develop at any time. So to protect yourself, you have to constantly check a Geiger counter. I only had to do it for a few hours. But it's a reality every single day for the workers. One of them told me about his experience. Tetsuya Hayashi spent 50 days at Fukushima Daiichi in 2012. He says actual work is limited to three to four hours a shift because of the time it takes to put on protective gear and undergo radiation screenings. And that gear makes it much more difficult to get things done. I was told I should work 50% slower than on a normal job. Once I got started, I definitely understood why. The slightest move makes you feel like you're short on oxygen. About 3,500 workers labor at the plant every day. Hayashi says he was surprised by the amount of radioactive waste they generate. We have to change at least two or three times a day, and our suits can't be reused. It means we're disposing of between 5,000 and 10,000 protective suits each day. We also wear double or triple layers of rubber gloves, which are all thrown away. I don't know how many years this whole operation will take, but it will generate an incredible amount of radioactive waste. One day, his supervisors asked him to go into an area with high levels of radiation. He refused and left his job. Radiation was so high, workers could only stay there for five or ten minutes at most. I did not go. I knew someone had to do it, but I couldn't. So, Yoichiro, what else is TEPCO doing to minimize workers' exposure, aside from making them wear protective gear? The government has set 50 millisieverts as the annual exposure limit for workers. That's 50 times the level for civilians. When workers reach the limit, they must take the rest of the year off. If that's the case, how does TEPCO maintain a workforce at the plant? Managers rotate workers, so their exposure is spread out over longer periods of time. In some places, crews can only spend 10 to 15 minutes before they need to leave because radiation levels are so high. So TEPCO is constantly recruiting people across Japan and training them. Officials say safety is a top priority, but the recruitment and management of workers are outsourced to other companies. That means it's up to those companies to care for their personnel. Some critics say there needs to be a centralized system to monitor the workers' health. This is not just about protecting individuals. It's crucial for TEPCO to maintain a skilled workforce over several decades. Okay, thanks, Yoichiro. We'll get back to you a little later. Also coming up on this edition of Newsline Focus, from mini boats loaded with high-tech equipment to robots of all shapes and sizes, we'll show you how engineers are figuring out ways to do crucial work in lethal locations. Let's take a look at the roadmap for decommissioning Fukushima Daiichi. TEPCO and the government drew it up together. They call the removal of spent fuel rods from the Reactor 4 building the first milestone of the process. That operation began last November. It's expected to be finished by the end of this year. After that, the plan is to move on to the other three reactor buildings. The government and TEPCO want to finish removing the spent fuel rods and start extracting the melted fuel by 2020. That's the year Tokyo hosts the Olympics. Taking out that fuel is expected to require another 10 to 15 years. Then crews will start dismantling the reactors. 
The estimated completion date for that job is 2051 at the latest, 40 years after the accident. But some experts say the entire decommissioning process will likely take longer. One of the major factors slowing things down is the constant buildup of contaminated water. Looking at Fukushima Daiichi from the air, you can't miss them. Hundreds of storage tanks. TEPCO workers are using the containers to hold contaminated water, now more than 400,000 tons worth. They inject hundreds of tons of water into the three crippled reactors every day to cool melted fuel. It becomes highly contaminated, and it leaks from containment vessels and accumulates in the basements of reactor buildings. On top of that, hundreds of tons of groundwater seeps into the site every day and also becomes tainted, adding to the amount that needs to be stored. Workers pump the toxic water into the tanks. One tank fills up in two and a half days, so crews are also building more of them to increase storage capacity. In the past year, some of the tanks suffered major leaks and each time TEPCO officials held a news conference to explain the situation. We have to announce that another leak has happened. We would like to apologize for this situation. Engineers are trying to filter out as many radioactive materials as possible from the water to minimize the impact on the environment in case of another leak. They're using a complex setup known as ALPS, or Advanced Liquid Processing System. It can remove all radioactive particles except tritium, but it's being dogged by frequent breakdowns. And Yoichiro Tatewa joins us again. Yoichiro, what is TEPCO doing to deal with the buildup of contaminated water? Well, one crucial step is stopping the groundwater from seeping into the plant. Engineers are planning on freezing the area around the reactor buildings. The process involves inserting pipes into the soil and constantly running coolant through them. Workers are also digging wells to divert the groundwater that flows down from the nearby mountains. Experts say there's another problem, that there's a large amount of contaminated water in underground trenches. Yes, the trenches were designed to carry seawater to the reactor's cooling system. A network of trenches runs between the reactor buildings and the shore. They are flooded with extremely radioactive water that's been trapped there since the triple meltdown. TEPCO data shows concentrations of cesium up to 4 million times above the government safety limit. Engineers estimate the trenches hold about 15,000 tons of toxic water, but radiation levels are too high for them to get a more precise look at the situation. Some experts point out these trenches are a source of contamination for the Pacific Ocean. TEPCO says there's no evidence of that yet, but it recognizes the need to act quickly. Here again, engineers are planning to create an ice wall. They will insert pipes into the trenches and then pump in refrigerant. Water will freeze and work as a plug preventing more water from flowing in. Then they'll pump out the water from the trenches. The last step will be to pour in concrete to seal them off. There are already hundreds of thousands of tons of contaminated water in storage tanks. What's TEPCO's plan to deal with it? The first step is to decontaminate the water to minimize the risk it poses to the environment. As we saw earlier, engineers are using a system to filter out radioactive particles. But one element called tritium cannot be removed. The International Atomic Energy Agency and some experts say TEPCO will have to consider releasing the treated water and the tritium into the ocean. Local authorities, fishermen, and environmental activists are opposed to that. TEPCO says it will continue storing the water for the time being. 
Yoichiro, thanks for being with us. To stop the buildup of contaminated water at Fukushima Daiichi, engineers will also need to get to the source. Their first investigation is underway in the Reactor 1 building. Engineers are trying to find out how water is leaking from the reactor containment vessel. They've been exploring the containment vessel of Reactor 1. They used a small device designed like a boat to navigate a place where no human can go. The project brought together nuclear experts from universities and the private sector. They had a budget of about $3 million. They fitted the boat with a camera and a video transmitter. And they used a cable to control the device because radiation scrambles wireless signals. Engineers planned their operation in response to the harsh environment of the Reactor 1 building. They rotated in 15-minute shifts to minimize their exposure. The engineers successfully placed the boat alongside the containment vessel. The device sent back a radiation reading of 2,000 millisieverts per hour. Anyone exposed to that would die in a few hours. The boat transmitted these images, showing water flowing down the side of the containment vessel. The camera captured another leak nearby. Contaminated water was gushing out of a broken pipe. Engineers are confident this type of device will prove useful as they continue to probe the reactors. But they know it is just one of many tools they'll need in the decommissioning process. Some of those tools are in development. Robots will play a major role in the decommissioning of the plant. More importantly, the removal of melted fuel. Researchers and engineers are now focused on designing robots that can do decontamination work. This device relies on a laser beam to evaporate radioactive substances. Then it uses a vacuum to collect the radioactive dust. This model is designed to cut through the rubble that's scattered inside reactor buildings because of the explosions. We're proud of this robot, which will be used in areas inside Fukushima Daiichi that people cannot access. The most daunting challenge is removing the nuclear fuel that has solidified on the bottom of the reactor containment vessels. Extremely high levels of radiation have made the areas inaccessible. Engineers are exploring ways to reach it. They're trying to develop a 30-meter-long robotic arm. It will be equipped with sensors that allow engineers to visualize its movements in three dimensions. Radiation could affect all electronic parts of the robot, so we have to overcome that hurdle. This institute is developing a laser for the robotic arm. Teams of engineers are working on one that can slice through nuclear fuel thought to have solidified after melting down. The laser will have to operate underwater. The reactors need to be constantly flooded to keep the fuel stable and shield radiation. The institute ran an experiment to simulate the environment of a flooded reactor. The engineers injected gas into the water to clear a path for the laser so the beam wouldn't weaken. Then they aimed the laser at simulated fuel and managed to cut some of it. But the fuel at Fukushima Daiichi is expected to be much more difficult to deal with. Some of it mixed with debris when it melted down, making it more difficult to cut through than the simulated fuel. Engineers don't fully understand the condition it's in.
This is a huge challenge. We have to combine techniques in ways that we have never tested before. Some combinations will work, but in other cases, we will have to make fundamental adjustments. Engineers and workers at Fukushima Daiichi will be breaking new ground and making adjustments along the way for years to come. They're building on lessons learned from the past. A reactor at the Three Mile Island complex in the U.S. melted down in 1979. It took crews 11 years to remove the fuel. The decommissioning process is still underway 35 years after the accident. In 1986, a reactor exploded at Chernobyl in the former Soviet Union. A concrete sarcophagus was built to seal off the crippled unit. Authorities decided to wait for radiation to drop below lethal levels before decommissioning the plant. Experts say the operation will take another 100 years. As we've shown you, the operator of Fukushima Daiichi is also dealing with a long-term project. Workers face risks every day. Fukushima residents who used to live in communities around the plant face an uncertain future. Many still cannot go home. Their future depends on a safe and steady decommissioning process. Newsline will continue to bring you coverage of what's happening there in the months and years ahead. Thanks for watching our first edition of Newsline Focus. I'm Katherine Kobayashi.